Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, brought to you by Breitbart. I cannot tell you, my friend, how incredibly excited I am by my guest this week. He's an old friend of mine, and his name is Alain de Bottle. And I think he's probably about my most famous guest so far, so I'm really, really privileged to get him on the show. But also, I do have an in with him. He's an old, old mate of mine, um, whom I love very, very much. Alain, welcome to the show. James, such a pleasure to be on your show. Um, how, how do we describe you, Alan, to people who've never heard of you? Well, I write books and um, give talks and make films, and they're broadly hung together by concern for how to live well. Um, loosely a philosopher, essayist, very interested in psychology, ideas, and how we can live better lives. I'm not optimistic. I'm quite pessimistic. Right. I should not be mistaken for a... Uh, an evangelist of hope. Um, I believe that some of the best ideas are dark ones that cheer us up by making us feel less alone with what we're privately sad with. But I'm nevertheless on a quest to console. Uh, the word consolation. I read a book called The Consolations of Philosophy. And the word consolation is an interesting one. It doesn't mean winning and it doesn't mean losing. It means something in the middle. We were having a conversation before... I, I pressed the record button, and I think actually we should repeat it because I was going to ask you. I feel a bit of a failure in my life. Uh, I mean, I, I I I look at my dreams when I was in my final year of university, and I thought I thought, well, hell, I I, I was at Oxford. I've got I've got a great degree. I'm I'm really charming and funny and witty. I'm just going to be so rich one day, and so many good things are going to happen to me, and I'm obviously going to be famous too, and I'm going to have a really rich, satisfying life. But here I am, past 50 now, and it hasn't worked out that way. How do I deal with, with this crushing sense of failure? Well, look, I think anyone who matches their expectations hasn't got a proper capacity for hope and imagination. I mean, we should be humiliated and outstripped by, uh, you know, a reality should, should not match our hopes because we should be hoping in a big way. So it's very normal to feel that we haven't met our dreams. It's, you know, human beings are dreaming animals. That's what got us to the moon. It's what gets gets us to all great things. And therefore, um, we shouldn't berate ourselves for dreaming, but we do need to know how to cope with ourselves because all of us are failures in some area or other. I mean, no one is successful everywhere. And indeed, no one is a failure everywhere. We're all quite good at some things. Can I just say, I don't think, for example, right now, Donald Trump is saying to himself, I'm, I'm such a failure. I would seriously contradict that. I think he has a lot of anxieties and there are a lot of things that have not gone right in his life. I think there's a lot of unhappiness in the man. And like everybody, he's you know got areas of, of serious lack. Um, that's just the human condition. Um, I like the, well, you find it in Christianity. You know, Think of the notion of original sin. It really starts with the idea that everybody's broken, that there is no such thing as a perfect human, that the only thing that's perfect is this guy in the sky that we dreamt up. Well, sorry, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> but um, that, that essentially it isn't within the remit of human beings to be perfect. And that's a very good starting point because I think we, we're too tough on ourselves often for our imperfections. I mean, imperfections are just part of being human. Okay, but what about the bastards that I often meet in the course of my life in in the country, for example, and and even more so in London? And you meet people who've just totally lucked out. What happened to them is after university, they were contacted by an old university friend. They said, "I'm setting up this business which 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 sells widgets in in I don't know Mozambique." And and you look at them now, and they've got the the kids at Eton, and they've got the trophy wife, and they've got the incredible um, house in the country, and the lovely townhouse. There are some people out there who just luck out, aren't there? Look, there are a few people who've had extraordinary lives, but I think at the end of the day, you have to fall back on statistics. The statistics are against any optimistic, you know, take on life. Most people's marriages are questionable. Most people's finances are under the water. Um, most lives have got areas of serious unfulfillment. I mean, 
you know, people talk about the 1%. Um, you know, there's, there's only 1.5% of Americans who earn over $200,000 a year. So that means that most Americans are not living. Complete failures. Not living the, the great American dream yeah. as, it, as it's imagined. So, you know, those odds are terrifying and inhumane. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be expecting something that 99% of us are not going to get. I mean, that is a cruel way of living your life. It's like being a teenager and looking at a pop star's perfect physique and thinking, I want to be that person. You know, a kindly parent weans you away from that longing and says, of course it would be nice to be that person. But if you spend your life focusing on that, you're going to torture yourself and, and ruin your existence. Yeah, can I, can I just say, I, was, I am totally gutted that I was not Robert Plant or Jimmy Page or, or David Bowie. I, I mean, I, I would have preferred being David Bowie before he died unexpectedly and suddenly. But James, let's remember that there are people out there who are saying, my life's a bit meaningless. I haven't achieved anything. Why can't I be like that guy, James Dellingpot? And <laughs> who are these they freaks? Are, they, yeah. they are thinking that. And, you know, uh, they need help. so you have, you have a lot of things that are going well in your life. But, you know, we're focused on always on the things that are missing. That's just how we are. We're made by our biology like that. But it's good every now and then to, you know, there's that rather cheesy word, gratitude. But I think gratitude is an important emotion, especially as one gets older. We, we met when we were young people. We're now old people. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the end of every day, if something hadn't, something really big hasn't gone wrong, you should just spare a moment and think, okay, today it, this didn't happen. That didn't happen. You know, I, I got over the threshold of today. And it's good to spare a moment for that. So are you, are you saying to me that, that actually I should be somehow grateful for all the terrible shit I've had in the last 10 years because somehow I've I've emerged as a better person or, 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 or should I just be accepting of it because that's what happens and you deal with it uh, suck it up I think you should be grateful that you're here um that it hasn't been worse. Dead. Yeah, yeah. That it hasn't been worse that actually luck ingenuity talent friendship got you through um that's and true. Friendship. Friendship. I'm got totally you. with you there. Yeah. yeah. Carry on. Uh, and and other things and mind you you earned that friendship because friendship are things that you know one earns. So it's not just luck; it's you know something you did. Um, and look, I think at the end of the day, you know, I've just been reading about the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greeks had a wonderful idea that the condition of man is tragic. And what they meant by that is that all of us have got good sides and blind spots, and we're asked to live before we know how to live. We don't have the right information for how to make good decisions. We're, we're called upon to, to act without the necessary skill. And of course, we make mistakes all the time. I mean, you know, one of the fascinating questions to ask anyone is, what mistakes have you made? And oh my God, I mean, everybody has made the most unbelievable errors all the time. It's very hard when you're standing outside somebody's life to know what those might be. But everybody's made them. And we just have to build a kind of a world in which we can tolerate ourselves, even though we have failed. The has that book been done? I think it's quite a good book idea, isn't it? My my, my mistakes. Uh, I think it's. I think there it is. It's a book idea. Yeah, it's a book idea. My mistakes. Um, because I must say, I do take great consolation at the thought that other people are having really shit lives, uh, um, but they're just not not. Is, is that it? People just are not admitting it. So we just we just don't see beneath the surface. Everyone's putting on the front. Um, let me tell you, I I run something in London called the School of Life, and we try and explore people's psychology, try and help them in various ways. We run a therapy service, etc. Anyway, we, we get a lot of people who come in who are ready to divulge the sort of stuff you wouldn't mention at a dinner party or you wouldn't necessarily mention casually to a friend. They're the sort of the trickier end of human nature. And you wouldn't believe the, the, the agony of pain. I mean, if you put a megaphone to the, you know, you would hear a howl across the capital um, at the sort of stuff that comes in. It's not, it's not, cinematic it's not worthy of newspapers but it's it's really sad just sad things parents and children who don't communicate terrible sexual problems terrible financial problems terrible errors etc this is the human lot and yet you look at the adverts and you think everybody's smiling you think oh why am i not you know having a holiday in st bart's this year it's um we're we're torturing ourselves with ideals that actually don't belong to anyone and I think one of the roles of art, which I can include a podcast, is to broaden yes. the conversation um, so that richer data about what it is to be human gets out there and people start to compare themselves more accurately with, um, 
you know, you, you know, on social media, people people often complain and they say things like, "Well, Instagram, people selling their fantasies, etc." One of the one of the promises of social media was, um, once you take, once you give ordinary people a voice, they'll stop peddling the sort of lies that mainstream media give you about what life's really like. And actually, you find, without any particular malicious intent, there's just something in human nature that means that when people write about their lives on Facebook, on Instagram, etc., it's just as airbrushed as anything that Madison Avenue might come up with. And in other words, we're still having quite a hard time admitting our vulnerabilities, our shared frailties, etc., still remarkably hard. And I think that's the trick. You know, how do we, how do we get that kind of information out there? And I think for me, that's where art comes in. You know, great movie, great novel often tells you all the stuff that is not mentioned the rest of the time. Did you see that wonderful film by Richard Linklater, Before Midnight? Um, remind me. Julie Delpy, Ethan Hawke, A Marriage. Anyway, it's one of the yeah. great films about marriage because it's a couple, they're in their late 40s, they've had children... And they love each other, but they drive each other mad. And they spend basically three quarters of the film throwing their regrets, anger, resentment at one another. And I remember seeing this in a, in a cinema and people were crying, mesmerized by this, the honesty and basically going, I think that's my life. But it's not the life that you'd ever seen in a Hollywood film. And you know, the philosopher Theodore Adorno once said that the most dangerous man in America was Walt Disney. And I think by that he meant that the thing about Walt Disney is he's selling us images of life which do not reflect our lives and thereby leave us feeling alienated and sad with the lives we're actually leading, which are not always terrible, but we don't ascribe them dignity. We don't, uh, we don't think they're normal, whereas actually they are normal. I'm feeling very consoled by this. And actually, what you said about the power of art, I've discovered this later in life. I've, I've started learning poetry, so sometimes it takes me a month to learn it. I mean, like I've, I've just done um, Kublai Khan, which is quite quite tricky, but ones with it with a meter and stuff mm. like like um, shall I compare thee to a summer's day are much much easier. But I find it tremendously consoling. A because it's good to know that I haven't my Alzheimer's hasn't kicked in properly yet, and B because I've always wanted to be one of those people that's got a, a literary quote. Um, on the uh, you know available for every opportunity, and suddenly I have become that person. I've got and I've got a treasury of poetry in my my head. And of course, there's no better way to understand a poem than to and to get into the head of the person who wrote it and 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 uh, their choice of words and their choice of meter and 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 you realise what what they went through to create this poem. Uh, and also, Keats and um, uh, Shakespeare and Dunn, they're pretty good writers. Yeah, and I think you know what's interesting is that these people are dealing generally with experiences which we've all had. So the difference, what they're doing, is finding particularly resonant, evocative, dignified, mellifluous ways of saying things. And, you know, in this day and age, we're, we're, often, we're too keen on translating things from their original language. So people will say things like, I can't be bothered to read this. What is this guy really saying? And they want a quick summary. What's great about going to the original is you think there was a real point to the way that it was written. Um, and if I remember these beautiful words, the pain which these beautiful words might be describing will be somehow lessened, or the beauty that I'm experiencing in my life will be enhanced by the fact that I can align it with these lovely words. So there's, there's a way in which you know, elegant language dignifies, enhances, uh, lends. I sometimes think of it like a sort of amplifier. Um, you know, we, we feel these things. Great art is like an amplifier and it amplifies the sound, but also purifies it and makes it more harmonious. And um, we, we need that. And I think that's why, you know, people on their deathbeds will recite certain lines, certain resonant lines, and, and they'll bring them terrific consolation. So thank God we're language creatures and it really helps to know to put the right words to, to our confused feelings. Well, it's also good, you and I being both um, li living more or less by our, by our pens, we've, we've probably chosen the art form that most, most connects to people. Because, I mean, take the novel. One of the, people say, why should you study English literature at university? Well, because the novel is the way that you understand the human condition and, and what could be 
more important than discovering what may, makes people tick, how to live live the right life, how to make sense of this world. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's terribly sad. I, I've got a complaint with academics generally. I think that they are in charge in our society of some of the most valuable material, but um, they've got an agenda that's often about their own careers, about advancing up the academic system. Totally. And so very few of them are actually able to transmit the love for the subject that probably got them into the whole gig in the first place. But they're, they're interested in point scoring, minute details of academic only interest. And it means that the rest of us, you know, we've left our nice universities a long time ago, but these guys spend all their life with the great books. It's their duty. They're like the monks who should be praying for all of our souls. They should be, you know, they're the guardians of this stuff. They should be helping us. Uh, as we are in our daily lives, you know, we, we don't have time to kind of fill it through this great material. They should be helping to nourish us and feed us. But I think most academics have deserted their duties. They're not properly feeding the societies that ultimately feed them with the sort of soul food that, that we all need. And I think that, uh, you know, if I was in charge of the world, um, you know, the reward system of academics should be, certainly in the humanities, um, should be measured not on you know how many learned journals they're in, but how much of a love of the subject have they been able to transmit to a wide audience? God, I I was nodding furiously there because actually you, you've you've un, unwittingly hit upon a, a matter of great concern to me at the moment. I have I have a a boy who is very keen against all my bloody advice, I might tell you, to go and read English at university. And I look at the way he gets taught, what, what, the way English is taught now in a, in, a, in a very, very good good school. And the approach seems to me anathema to what I believe um, should be inspiring uh, the study of English literature. It's all about, it's all about uh, close critical analysis, which is, which, which ought to be, <sighs> there's something sterile about it. It's, it, it, it's like it, they're trying to turn study of English literature into a, a science rather than right. an art. That's right, because for them, they have to grade papers, they have to mark these things, and often they're latching onto the things that can be given in a sort of objective, supposedly pseudoscientific value. They're also very competitive with the sciences for funding, etc. And also C.P. Buddy Snow, that, that, yeah. th that lecture he gave, the, the Two Cultures, where he gave people in, in the arts a hang-up Mm. about being somehow inferior to bloody yeah. scientists. So I think I think that people in the humanities don't know how to talk about the value of their subject in a way that's both loyal to what's good about their subject and a way that can convince slightly sceptical outsiders, politicians, funders, etc. I think that our man Aristotle is the guy to go to. Um, the ancient Greek, you know, the way he talks about what tragedy is for, for example, he says it's for catharsis. It's to nourish... Our humanity it's to flex our ethical muscles you know these are the sort of stuff that, that great art does but it sounds a bit unfamiliar um, nowadays the language of justification for the humanities tends to be about I don't know inclusiveness yeah. or um, diversity, uh, diversity <laughs> which you know are maybe lovely things but um, they are actually untrue to really what this stuff's going to do for you and so in the end they don't do a service for for anything so um, I'm a passionate believer that the humanities should be put to work in our lives. I've got through some of the darkest times of my life through art. That's what I do. That's I'm the you know academics should be doing it for therapeutic reasons. I don't mean therapy just lying on the counter. I mean in the deeper sense, the, the you know the therapy of the soul. That's what they should be doing this stuff for. Um, that's how I got into it, and that's how I try and focus on this material. It's great material, should be put to work. So let's take one of our, our, our shared favourite films because it's so, so bleak. You recommended me a few years ago, Lilia Forever. And, you, and, and I said, what's it about? And you said, just, just watch it. And, the, and, and then I said, is it good? Is it bad? And you said, no, just, just, just watch it and get back to me when you've watched it. So I went home and started watching Lilia Forever. And it started off bleak. I think she was about to jump off a bridge and kill herself. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And halfway through, I found it so miserable that I stopped watching the film and, 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 and rang you at home to find out whether it got any worse or whether it, there was 
the, the arc suddenly got all jolly uh, or redemptive or whatever. And you weren't in. So I carried on watching it. And it is about the most depressing film ever made. But it's also, with retrospect, one of my favourite films. It's, it's a truly great film. Swedish director Lucas Moodison made a few great films. Hasn't been working in a few years. Um, it's wonderful. Um, the, the odd thing is it, it, it reminds us, I suppose, that um, very dark works of art are, you know, they're not, they're worth watching. We... We don't necessarily need to find them depressing. They can be sobering, stark, shocking, etc. But, you know, I mean, you could go and look at a, a tragedy, you could look at Macbeth, etc. You know, everyone ends up in a pile of blood on the floor and you think, oh, that's a bit depressing. But um, there are all sorts of ways in which dark art helps us to live. It, it, it mirrors our sorrows. It goes ahead of our own sorrows, making us feel fortunate. Uh, it prepares us for the darkest things. Look, I mean... Every human life ends in catastrophe. You know, our, our beautiful... It doesn't end well, certainly. <laughs> no. I mean, People it, get out of here alive. It, it, uh, you know, all of us have got the darkest things coming to us. We will see the Thanks people so that much. we love die, and we will ourselves die. And it is so grim that we need to flex our muscles in this area um, early on. And I think that great art gives us the best possible foretaste of the tragic aspects of life in a way that we can still bear life afterwards. I think it's why Thomas Hardy is perversely one of my favourite writers. I, I just read my favourite scene in literature <laughs> is when, when um, Jude the Obscure gets back home and finds his his kids have all topped themselves. And there's a suicide note which said, done because we are too many. And uh, <laughs> many spelled M-E-N-N-Y. So he'd never have got into, into Christminster. Um, and you just think, I thought my life was shit, but actually it could have been way shiter. <laughs> Absolutely. Or, you know, think of, the, think of that great scene by uh, Flaubert in Madame Bovary when Madame Bovary is laid out on her deathbed. She's swallowed arsenic, having run up debts. Her daughter, who she's neglected, is outside crying. Her husband is weeping. She's got minutes to live. Her life flashes past her. You know, everyone's in tears. It's it's unremittingly bleak. And yet, somehow, something important's going on. Because, you know, so for Aristotle, it's fear and pity. It's pity for the tragic hero, for the pain that humans have to go through. And um, and it's fear for ourselves, but a useful sort of fear, a fear which makes us grateful, modest, humble. I mean, I don't know, James, you've been through lots of difficulty. To, and I don't think this is ever a justification for difficulty, but presumably it's made you more tolerant, nicer of some of the darkness of, of the human heart and the places that people go to. You are totally right. I, I, I don't think it's made me... A a better person necessarily um i'm much less prone to i'll give you an example my little brother is a brilliant entrepreneur um he's a genius i mean he he's he's, he's one of the one of the greats uh, he's very very clever he's much cleverer than me but i noticed that sometimes in his judgments on my father he is slightly harsher than i would be and I think this is a young man's thing. He's, yeah. he's, he's about 10, 20 years young, younger than me. And I think the young are much harsher in their judgments. I tend not to judge people's um, moral failings. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, maybe I am I'm, uh, improved by tragedy. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting about judgment because judgment is always a sort of failure of the imagination. And, um, well, look, I, I'm a secular Jew, so we can talk about Jesus. But, you know, one of the interesting things about Jesus is such a, iconic figure in, in the Western tradition. But, you know, his idea is that if you understand love, you can love anyone. Such a striking and weird idea. What does that mean? You know, and, and he includes in the list the murderers, you know, the prostitutes, the, the you know, the, the dregs of his society, and we can just extrapolate from that ours too. And he says, you know, if you understand love, you should be able to peer into their hearts. And you know, think of Dostoevsky, a novelist who was very Christian in his, you know, approach to things. He takes us into the lives of the most broken people in his society, you know, murderers, addicts, etc., gamblers, etc. And and he goes behind the obvious disaster to show us 
the humanity. And I think that is love. I mean, love is the effort to go behind the, the surface, which might be quite unappealing, to look for attenuating reasons, to, to use the imagination to, to not judge. I mean, ju- you know, the closed judgment is the opposite of love. And I think it takes a few disasters in one's own life maybe you know hopefully not too large hopefully survivable before people get there and i think that perhaps you and i you know if we were told i don't know there's a mutual friend of ours he started drinking after that he you know did this did that you know and you know if we heard other people oh terrible man you know how did that happen you and i might go you know it's not great and you wouldn't want to condone it and you know poor family and you know pity that you blew the finances etc but maybe we wouldn't go bad man. We would feel pity, sorrow. Uh, and I think that is, that's one of the fruits of maturity. By the time you're losing your hair, um, you should Which be able- Which we both are, yeah. You should, you know, we should be able to do that stuff. Mm. I think it's one of the things that older people can do and, and should be rightly celebrated. Mm. Why not? You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my delightful special guest, Alain de Bottle, brought to you by Breitbart. More in a moment. Check out the official Breitbart store today. Store.breitbart.com is the home for the brand new official Breitbart store. Head there now for products for men and women, as well as collectibles like the limited time only retro 2016 presidential coffee mug or a Breitbart Border Patrol Coos. Store.breitbart.com has these items and many more. So get your gear now at store.breitbart.com. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to Delling Pool, the podcast with me, James Delling Pool, brought to you by Breitbart, with my very special guest and friend, Alain de Bottle. Alain, I think some people, the, 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 there is a constituency out there who knows me only as a kind of evil right-wing bastard. Uh, um, obviously, I don't think I am, but they think of me as such and they, they know me for my politics. I think they might be surprised to find me breaking bread with and, and being friends with somebody who they'd probably consider a member of the of the liberal elite. Bless the liberal elite. <laughs> you are, aren't you? I mean, you, you, you are part of the liberal elite. I, I'm not part of it, but I identify with a lot of positions which are liberal. So if you, if you ask me for my views on many things, but not all things, I'm not an uncritical adherent, but um, I'm, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I, I'm. I don't identify with right wing positions on most yeah. subjects. I'm, I'm a centrist. I'm essentially a centrist. We're not going to talk about politics. We're not going to talk about politics. But, but 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 I was just sort of setting the scene for. I imagine actually there would be more of your friends who would be appalled to know that you were a friend of mine. Actually, think, thinking about it, wouldn't there? The, the, you, I bet you know people who would be. You, your friends with James Denny Um No, I mean I hope not because you know judgment. I mean, look, I think it's. Um, I, I, I've seen your politics grow and, and emerge. And, you know, when we first met, they weren't there. I think they, they slowly emerged. Um, and I've seen the world change around us. And so, in, in you know, in a curious way... In accordance way, with my vision. It is in accordance with your vision. I mean, the world is now much more in accordance with your, your vision. Um, and I think it's all... Look, it's all very interesting. For me, it's very interesting to, to get a view, you know, via someone I know I into, a posi- you. into a position um, which you know you were just telling me about your friend Steve Bannon um, who you know is a is a liberal hate figure yeah, yeah. Um, but he's also someone that you know and, and it's true and, you're not going to get unless you know somebody like me mm. you're not even going to get a, another perspective on Steve mm. Bannon all you're going to know is, is is the stuff you get from the from the, the, the liberal media which is yeah. but I didn't want to want to go down the political um, avenue particularly I just wanted to um, muse on how how odd it is that you and I uh, are friends and have been friends over the years, uh, but some people don't stay one's friends, do they? Well, James, I think the you know the interesting thing about you, um, and this takes on generally into I love the subject by the way, a, a consideration really yeah. of, of friendship in in general is that you're warm as a person, and what, what does one mean by warm? You know, many people, particularly in this country, are polite. Uh, but slightly cold. And I think by that I mean that they are not prepared to share vulnerabilities. And I think that the ultimate 
and primary glue of friendship, I think, is the admission that behind the facade, there are challenges. I think that's how two people, particularly two men, can become friendly. But it's, it's very hard, as I say, particularly for men to do that because there is such an onus on strength. And, um, you know, most men gather together to show off and uh, to assert how well things are going. And from the first moment that I saw you was somebody who would say things like, I'm about to go into this party and I'm nervous or uh, I've just written an article and I think it's bad or I've just... Did I say that? (laughs) No, just back in those (laughs) days. Uh, Or, you know, I'm supposed to be friendly with this person but I worry I hate them or whatever it is. But essentially material that is vulnerable leaves you open to humiliation by those who are unkind. And actually it's on that, on the basis of that material that loyalty can be built up. You can't you can't make a loyal friend until you've risked something with them um, and you've put yourself slightly in a position of danger. And I think that you're very um, wise in your ability to put yourself at risk vis-a-vis people and to say, I need help, I'm lost, I'm scared, whatever. And this um, makes you very charming. I should add something else. People might at this point go, doesn't it all sound very needy? And I think there's a certain ideal relationship that one might have towards one's own vulnerability. The There is such a thing as the needy person who you ask them how they are and they say actually not that well and they start bursting into tears and you know it's six hours before you're able to get on with your life because they're in pieces. Now of course that does happen and that's fine and sometimes that has a place but I think um, there's a way of being both vulnerable and having a little bit of distance enough to have a bit of humour on your situation enough to remember that other people have got their own challenges and can't spend all the time with yours etc etc so there's a way of being both following many of the rules of politeness while at the same time adding that added ingredient of warmth and humanity and and that's a very it's a very hard trick to pull off you know most people are either sort of too cold or or else so intimate they make demands on you that actually you can't meet etc etc so it's 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 really an art Uh, in my ideal world there might be a lesson on it at school. How do you do this? How do you present yourself in a way that's human but not doesn't bug people? Um, these things are, you know, tricky things. But anyway, you you've learned that quite intuitively. It's a part of your nature. Yeah. Well, I I, I think it probably is unusual among men generally. Actually. I think it's unusual among men. I think it's difficult being a man. I think that one, you know, we used to talk a lot about girls when we were younger men, and it was respectable to do that. Um, and I think it's. Um, I think men are men are generally bores because they can't access the parts of the personality that um, that are dependent on interest. I mean, when we think of what's an interesting person, you know, it's not necessarily someone who's travelled around the world and met interesting and amazing people and you know done extraordinary feats. It's essentially somebody who's willing to listen to the data from their sort of deepest soul and can transmit it to somebody else. Can can give you the truth about what it is to be them in a way that's relatively honest. And most people don't do that. They talk about what's on the news. They talk about what they feel they should talk about. So you surface stuff. And you come away thinking, I've not really learned anything or I don't really know this person, etc. So you feel more lonely with them than you would on your own. And I think that you avoid that. But maybe, I, I think actually the natural state for men is doing stuff together and actually not not even speaking sometimes like one of my happiest days last year was going fly fishing with a bunch of chaps on a particularly good beat of um some famous fly fishing river in in dorset and the good thing about fly fishing is that you're you're at least um sort of 50 yards apart from the the next person on the river because you don't want to be crossing crossing the lines and stuff and you have a great boys day out you're not talking to each other, just being men, doing a manly thing together. And actually, you know what? I think if there'd been women there, it would have rather rather ruined the experience. Sometimes, sometimes chaps need to do chap stuff yeah, together. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, have, I went to all male English boarding school, and and this gave me a lasting horror of of being in overly male environment. Right. So I'm not sure I'd agree with you there, but I do agree that doing things is very important. And you know, I was recently invited for dinner. Uh, at somebody's house and shortly before uh, the guests arrived uh, a water pipe burst in the house 
And it set off a real crisis. I mean, there was a danger that the house would be lost, you know, if, if so there was water cascading down the stairs, uh, there were a fire engine that was caught. I mean, it was an unbelievable emergency. We were all drenched. And the fact of this event was to bond us all together in a way that we would never have done. I mean, one wanted to take a hacksaw to the average uh, water pipe and, and do that at the start of every gathering of people, because suddenly we had a shared need, sides of ourselves that wouldn't have emerged during conversation, etc. And, you know, sometimes people say things like, oh, you don't make friends like you did when you were a child or when you were at university. And I think some of the reason is not that you don't meet people who are as interesting as people were then. It's more that when you're a child or, or, or a student or, or whatever, you get to do stuff with people. And that's so important. You know, most of adult friendship nowadays takes place in restaurants, bars, cafes, static places where between you, you know, you've just got a bowl of sugar and, and that's it. And that's very hard to develop a friendship. But also they take place in places of, of comfort. So you're having, a, you're having right. nice food and you've got some booze. Whereas when you're, at, as I was, and, and probably you were too, at a a prep school with a with a, a regime so harsh it was like being in cold it's well you've got this tremendous bonding experience it's you against the system and it's why by the way i have this theory i don't know whether you agree with this that that actually ultimately any man who hasn't been to to war and seen combat is fundamentally a failure as a man i wouldn't go that that far um uh, thank god most of us haven't seen combat and i wouldn't want to well, i'm glad i haven't now yeah no, well and actually I, i'd love to have seen combat and come through it and and been enriched and and had a really good war and got a medal that would be be great but i know it's not always like that yes i don't know i mean you do hear reports that in the second world war in london for example during the worst days of the blitz there was an intensity to life that people thereafter when times had got safer again people would look back and, and miss people uh, would have a lot of sex uh, in in not necessarily in sort of cold and cynical ways, but just um, hesitation would be overcome. The feeling that you know if you liked someone and they liked you, well, maybe there was something to be done about that. Or if there were things you had to get off your chest and tell someone, you would do that because you might not be there by nightfall. And in a sense, we shouldn't need the blitz to make you know that the fact if we would need the blitz that's because we really lack imagination because the fact is that strokes will do that for you you know we each face our miniature blitzes every day of the year i mean uh, you know you can be swept away i read a statistic the other day Five hundred thousand people die in england every year uh, those deaths affect closely five people so you've got around two million people in the uk who are experiencing death very close up that that's should, about one in 30 yeah that should spur but it's every year yeah. and so you know death is all around and its presence should not merely depress us but also impel us to you know to reach out and do all those things that we want to do mean to do etc it's a terrific agent of um anti-timidity but it's not like the victorians where where you had families of of seven children and then and then five of them would get wiped out by cholera or or, or, or smallpox or, or whatever I, I think we're very good at shoveling death aside and pretending it doesn't doesn't happen I, I once interviewed Wes Craven the the horror movie director and he was talking to me about about one of the things that motivated his his horror films and the way that we walked around in a state of of sort of denial about death which he found extraordinary given how easy it was to um, to kill somebody that we're, we're we're walking around in these we haven't got spikes on our back we haven't got got armor or that's or, right I mean a branch can kill us exactly and yeah and yeah. and the the the, the, the the, the human condition is to pretend this this isn't the case and we're yep. going to live forever. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things, so I mentioned that I was a secular Jew, but nevertheless, I've got quite an appetite for many of the things that religion used to do for us. And I think one of the things that it used to do for us is to uh, give us a timetable for some important things that we keep forgetting. Um, it's not that intellectually we don't know that they're there, but emotionally we're not plugged into them. So, for example, we forget we're going to die. We forget that springtime is very beautiful. We forget there are things to be grateful for. We forget that there, we should forgive people. We forget all these things. And religion at its best put these in our diary. And so gave us a feeling that throughout the year there would be sort of rendezvous with important ideas. You know, now's the time to think of death. Now's the time to remember those who have died before. There, now's the time to, you know, make amends with people you've quarrelled with, whatever it is. And I think that that's um, a, a lovely thing. And it just came to mind when you said, 
you know, we're so fragile, but we don't think about it. Um, partly we don't think about it because we don't think about many things that we need to keep thinking about because um, we don't have timetables for, you know, the important stuff. You know, think of our diaries. What's in our diaries? It's only ever meetings uh, with people. Think of the religious calendar, the religious diary. It was an appointment with a set of ideas. And we, that sounds bizarre. You know, we've, we've left it all, we've left to private life a lot of the things that used to belong to communal life. Um, and that was quite nice when it was part of the community, you know, that the community would gather and celebrate the fact it's springtime. You know, last year I went to, we're talking, by the way, on a beautiful March uh, afternoon, and it's been raining more or less solidly for four months and dark. The yeah. sun hasn't shone for four months in this dark island we live on. It's like, it's, it's the pathetic fallacy. It's like it knew that we were going to meet today, Anna, exactly. and have this, have this podcast. And so for the first time, we're seeing trees, you know, cherry trees, with, uh, you know, the blossom is out all over London. Beautiful. And this time last year, I was in Japan and took the children to Japan and we had a wonderful time. And it was this time of year, and this is called cherry blossom uh, season. And so what they do is it's part of Zen Buddhism that they will have a religious ceremony. They recite beautiful poetry in front of uh, any cherry blossom tree that they can find. They have picnics in front of it and it's totally on the map. And the other day, my son was, my younger son was saying to me, isn't it funny? Here we are. There are lots of cherry blossom trees all out. No one's paying any attention to them at all. And I said, yeah, well, we don't have Zen Buddhism. If we were Zen Buddhists, we'd think, oh, wow, it's cherry blossom season time. So it's just an example of how we're quite lazy if we don't have little prods. We forget the important stuff. And I think culture, broadly defined, should be the kind of prod, the institutional prod that, that makes us meet those important uh, emotions that we'd otherwise forget. Can I just be a, a miserable bastard at, at this point? Um, since moving to the, the country, yeah. I have become acutely conscious of the changing seasons because obviously when you when you go out of the house, you are exposed to big skies and yeah. weather. And I notice stuff that, well, if you live in town, you, you maybe go to the, the country every other weekend. I see minute changes in my environment. I walk the same walks every day. I see the sheep, the, the lambs growing into... into the, there's a wonderful stage right now, actually. I'm mean, sorry, I'm about to get lyrical. And I, I said I was going to get miserable. Um, there's a glorious moment about about one week into the, the time when the lambs have been dropped in the fields. Um, and they form gangs. Right. And they start playing with each other. They're, they're, it's like watching gangs of gangs of kids, and they're and they're all romping and having fun. And and the the mums are the, the youths are watching and going meh meh, and the kids are just frolicking and gambling like lambs are supposed to do. And it, it and it does does um, make the heart lift. But at the same time, what I was going to say is that I'm conscious each year of how. Um, suddenly the seasons are changing how much more quickly they change than last year and it just makes me aware of 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 mortality because of course each year that passes is a smaller proportion of your life than the yep. previous one that's right that's right i hate that acceleration of time yes and i think it it places an onus on um trying to savor the experience you know and trying to slow down time because time is uh, you know, can be fast forwarded or, 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 or paused. And I think that one of the ways we pause, we talked about poetry earlier, you know, a poem is very often an attempt to hold uh, a precious and very evanescent moment and, and just fix it. And I think that's what, you know, that's what we need to do, even necessarily, not necessarily writing poetry, but just some way of, of holding moments, you know, holding the moment when you're seeing those lambs, making more of it, making more of these small things. But we can do, look, it's, all, it's okay for, 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 for you and I to say that because we are now getting on to be old men and and we're, we're aware of our mortality. But you try saying that to to your kids sure. or my kids. Say, look, you must appreciate the gambling of the lambs. They might, they, they might look at them for all of three seconds before going back to their Snapchat. But if, if you can get Snapchat in the country, I think the probably reception around us is really bad. But, but you know what I'm saying? That... that yeah, sure, we can dig all this this stuff when we're old, but yes, I mean, look, one of the most perplexing aspects of uh, parenthood is that lessons that you've accumulated with such care um, over so and with such pain over so many years uh, seem remarkably resistant to transmission, and I think that um, 
you know, it partly explains why humanity is so stupid, because we need to keep relearning lessons. We're, we're very bad at knowledge transfer. You know, that's a rather ugly term, but kind of useful it's term. It's not our fault. It's the bloody kid's fault. Well, but I mean, it's, you know, it's every generation that we're, we're quite good when it comes to science. You know, we, we're not having to reinvent, you know, the laws of physics every generation. And, and, you know, we're quite good at just knuckling down and learning so that we can accumulate knowledge and get you know, we are now cleverer. A slightly stupid 16-year-old can be cleverer than Isaac Newton. And that is the fruit of, that's what education should be. Education should be to allow mediocre people to be as clever as the cleverest people of the olden times. That's what education should be. Unfortunately, we're not very good at this in the area of what you could broadly call the humanities or emotional knowledge. So that, you know, People whose parents got divorced, fought, et cetera. The parents gradually accumulated some knowledge about relationships, et cetera. And out come the children, and they're going to make all the same mistakes again. You know, and it's very, you know, there are systematic kind of failures to, to transmit this stuff. And I think um, it's difficult because we've swallowed hook, line, and sinker a romantic idea that... Um, the greatest sort of wisdom is spontaneous wisdom. That's why, you know, why are children so precious to us? I hate the romantics. Romantics, I agree with you. The romant romanticism but is, is, is single-handedly responsible for most of the bad ideas of the world. And one of the bad ideas is the notion of spontaneous genius, and that's why we venerate children and mystics, etc. I think um, that it's terribly helpful if children, without being oppressed by the notion, feel that those who've been on the earth for 40 more years than them, might have some insights they don't. And therefore, it's good to keep half an ear open because you might pick stuff up and save yourself some time. And our culture is really unhelpful. It has a kind of institutionalized rejection of kind of knowledge transfer. And that's why we keep making so many mistakes because no kid of 16 would ever want to listen to a 90-year-old. Maybe we should use what's left of our time to build a time machine and go back and kill... Rousseau, um, uh, Thoreau, um, words with obviously would have to be first on the death list. No um, death, no death. But at least, at least put right. We well, could have had. Tell them to get a proper job. <laughs> stop, stop writing. I, I mean, listen. You know, this is a. I, I recently wrote a novel about love, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about relationships. And the more I thought about relationships, the more I kept thinking romanticism is the problem. Because let me give you an example. I mean. Romanticism has this idea that a good relationship is one where by a kind of magical intuition you meet someone, you know they're right, you're blind, but it's beautiful. Um, you get together with them and you'll share every secret. They'll be your soulmate. They'll understand every part of you. You'll never be lonely. You'll spend all the time holding hands, walking in nature. Um, there'll be no practical things. You won't have to make any money. In fact, thinking of money is an evil thing, blah, blah, blah. All these things are terrible lessons for how to make a relationship work. They lead, for example, to an outbreak of sulking. Think of what sulking is. Sulking is the thought in a relationship, my partner doesn't understand me. Now, the reason why we expect our partners to understand us intuitively is that we've read so much romantic poetry, which is all about people understanding one another without speaking, just through a communion of souls. That's one of the most dangerous ideas at large in civilization because it leads people to think, Either my partner should guess what's going on in my mind, or they're evil. It's like, no, you need to use words. You need to struggle to understand yourself and convey that knowledge to another person in a way that they should understand. So I'm with you on romanticism being a really big problem. It gets in the way of so much. It gets in the way of careers as well. People think things like, I should just know what I want to do, and I shouldn't really think about it too much. I'm just led by an intuition. Well, nonsense. We know lots of people who've come adrift because actually their intuition didn't lead them to anything. So, yeah, we're, we're unable, I think, to capitalise on the knowledge and the experience of past generations and put it to use in the present, which is what we should be doing. And I care passionately about this. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole. Brought to you by Breitbart. And my special guest today is the marvellous, wise Alain de Botton. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Tim Schmidt is joining us now. He's a president and founder of U.S. Concealed Carry Association. The best part about concealed carry 
is that everybody doesn't have to do it for the vast majority of the population to get the benefit. You're going to have this powerful deterrent effect. Naturally, crime will, will go down because they're, they're never going to know who's going to have the gun. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. Welcome back to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, brought to you by Breitbart with my special guest, Alain de Botton. And we're talking about life and the meaning of life. And Alain, I've had a disturbing insight recently. Um, maybe I shouldn't be disturbed, maybe it's a good thing. But I kind of think that children are the most important thing. I, I, I don't want to sound cloying or, or anything else, but, but I look at my all the, the the minor achievements I've done and I look at the miseries of my life and I think, well, it kind of doesn't matter because ultimately all you're trying to do is create people better than you. Is that is that wrong? Um, look, I think it's a beautiful ideal. It does slightly depend. I mean, your children do seem particularly lovely. Um, Cheers, mate. On a bad day, um, I think... Look, here's, here's an unvarnished... F- my fear as a parent is I sometimes think I've given up an enormous amount of my life to raising two people Bastards. <laughs> who will be sort of like everybody else. Their life will be a mixture of pain, sorrow, you know, a bit of joy, etc. But they won't... I think, the, I think the fantasy of every parent is to create somebody who is substantially better than oneself. And I think that does happen to an extent, but never perhaps fully. And I think... Um, look, that said the ultimate justification for parenthood is that it teaches you about love ultimately um, because you're caring for someone and you're being so I mean I think none of us are as kind to anyone as we are to our own children Um, and not everybody's kind to their children but many people are and and they're and they're taught by their children to be more patient uh, more forgiving less judgmental um Children have a wonderful ability to see their parents' flaws and extremities. No, no man is a hero to his valet, but that's right. Try, try dealing with a teenage that's daughter. Right. <laughs> um, that that quote about no man is a hero to, to my valet to, to their valet is, uh, is one of my favourites. That's routinely brought out by me at dinner time. My children laugh and think I'm an idiot. Um, but but I think there's something wonderful. I mean, give, let me give you an example from my life. Uh, I'm sport phobic. I I can't bear I can't bear having a body. I just I would just like to be a brain in a vat. Um, the thought of having a body is very inconvenient. I never really liked it, and um, I've got a a younger son who is mad about football and is extremely talented, headhunted by various clubs, etc. He's ten years old and he's literally a football legend, which is so unlikely to me. It is almost as though somewhere in the divine mind, as it were, um, you know, somebody thought right. What are we going to do with this guy? He's so far on the extreme of not being in touch with his body, being alienated from physical activity. We're going to give him a son who's going to show him the way. And um, and I, I think that, you know, this... I, I think our children are there with lessons for us. And I think that very often we're trying to patch up the mistakes of our parents' lives in various ways. Where I think every life is lived in dialogue with the preceding generation in some way. And I think our lives are our reactions to, homages to, attempts to solve uh, the issues that the previous generation had. And, and this goes on. So you see it already with your own children. They're starting to respond like a kind of, you know, like a jazz duet to things that have happened in one's own life. So do you think God's punishing me um, by giving me a daughter who's a feminist? Totally, totally. Um, she, well, she's, I, I can't be that bad, surely. Well, you know, I think one of the great things about families, you know, we talked a little bit about, about politics. Obviously, the, the, the political debate is very fractured at the moment, and it's very easy for people to hate one, to look at the fact that someone disagrees with their political views and then to make the next logical step, which is to say that person's a bad person. One of the great things about families is that it prevents that from happening because... You know, your brother-in-law, you don't agree with him on anything political, but actually you're mowing the lawn together, you're looking after the kids together, you're in a water pistol fight together, and that forces you to recognise something that in the political arena you miss, which is, actually, I quite like this person. Do you know, this is true. I actually, this is this is something nobody listening knows, I, I don't imagine, that I have this, um, 
there was a kind of eco element to the Dellingpole family. There was my 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 little sister, uh, Mary Rose, is lives in Brighton and is married to an ardent greenie who's got one of those Perfect. hipster beards. Perfect. I mean, they are the kind of people who who hate my guts. In, in, in fact, they once went to one of their hippie, greeny, ghastly, campy things. And there was a stall where they had heads of evil people on sticks that they could throw <laughs> rocks at. And one of the heads on the stick was my head. Mm. So mm. this is my family. This is part of my family. But and it, and I, I, although I think their politics are stupid and wrong, I still love them very course. much. But isn't that a, there's such a lesson there for our times? that, you know, we should all have families and probably we all do have families where that's the case. And people have said things like, well, the thing about politics now is I'm not going to speak to my brother-in-law. I'm not going to speak to my mother, etc. That's surely the wrong way. The wrong way, the, the right way is to say, of course, you disagree violently on all these political things, but there's something else. You realise that there are other things. And, you know, I think it's very important to understand where views that you don't agree with are coming from. And, we're so good at knowing what we disagree with and so bad at understanding the origins of those ideas and sympathising with those who hold them. And um, I think, look, I, I think you love the sin or hate the sin. I mean, I, I know f- for a fact that May, Rose, um, May Rose's green politics come from her stupid gland. She's got a stupid gland which produces wrong ideas. And and this is a problem with the left generally, that, that, that they... I discussed this on a previous pod, pod, podcast with with, with Jacob Rees Mogg. That, that, that my theory is that that um, the, the liberal left they haven't evo- evolved properly. Just, I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> I don't agree with anything you're saying, but I love you nevertheless. Um, <laughs> no. It's proof in action of what we're talking about. But actually, there's, there's one more thing that that um, again people might not know, which is that that Brexit caused a tremendous rift in my family. It was like right. it was like the English Civil War. Well, of sorry, the Civil War rather. I mean, we, we had the first one before the Americans did. Uh, in the Civil War, where you would have brothers fighting against brother on the battlefield, yep. father against son. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. I, I'm I'm totally of the view that you should your friends, their politics shouldn't matter. Uh, they really shouldn't get in the way. But I I know that lots of people. There are going to be people listening to this podcast, for example, and particularly in America, I think, where politics are much more polarized than here. If if I'd, in my London period, if I'd rejected friends on the grounds of their lefty politics, I wouldn't have had any friends, basically. That's so right. you, ha- you have to transcend right. it's, it's it, it is really important to be constantly confronted by people who are re- put you in a really awkward emotional position because you like them and you disagree with them. Yeah. And, and I think that that's teaching us something so important. Uh, and there's nothing worse than the kind of silo where... We're just never encountering difference, and and that is one of the great things about families. And and as a, anyone who's ever had a child will know that your children are almost genetically programmed to challenge your views. And and probably again, let's not think about nature as having a grand plan for us. But if there were to be a grand plan, we can see that intelligence is clearly based on a dialectical collision of ideas and emerges from a collision. And therefore, you know, nature's been quite clever in in setting us up with children who are programmed to um to challenge yeah and there does seem to be this weird regression to the mean doesn't there whereby for example it's a classic um trajectory of the the entrepreneur makes the money and and he's really he's really switched on and incredibly hard working and then what the what the son does is is inherits the money spends it um and like probably goes to goes to academe actually and probably gets a job in one of the uh, uh, studies in the liberal arts and then he runs the foundation which gives money to the causes that the father would absolutely have loathed probably to the environment stuff like that yeah and and he probably has a drug habit and then the grandson probably uh, well, by or, then it's over yeah or might remember the example of the grandfather and swing back the other way yes and so yes i mean we do we're always i mean the terrible thing is, couldn't we try and correct these swings of the pendulum within our lives? And I think that, um, you know, that's perhaps what we should be aiming to do as well, um, to try and find equilibrium in a life rather than within a generation, within a few generations. Well, we've only um, got, I mean, un- unless you, you, you're a, a fervent fervent um, Muslim or Christian or whatever, yeah, we probably only have one life. Well, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so we should try. But, um, but yes, I mean, it's very... Um, you know, I, I had a father who um, 
whose own upbringing was incredibly severe and therefore he was incredibly uh, focused and, and tough and in his child raising uh, methods was you know quite victorian and, and and stiff and cold so i've tried to correct that by overindulging my children and and being you know incredibly kind and present and you know emotional with my children um who knows where that pendulum is going to swing you know in the other way but we're all the time in this kind of dialogue with the past and um um, but it's, it's interesting you say that because my experience with my parents, I had very lax, uh, benign, loving parents, uh, very laissez-faire. And my response to that was to be very laissez-faire, benign. Right. I'm, I'm exactly yeah. the same as my... And, and the result is that my children are appallingly indisciplined. Um, so in some cases, very foul-mouthed and, and rebellious. But without much to rebel against, really, because I just sort of indulge them and give them what the hell, yeah. the hell they want. Well, maybe, want. you know, maybe if it worked. Um, it's interesting, I was just reading this wonderful psychoanalyst called Donald Winnicott, who was alive in the 60s, and he he was very interested in the idea of children who were made to be too good too early. He was very interested in goodness, but he tried to figure out why there's this idea of the kind of overly good boy or girl who actually becomes quite a menace to themselves and to society long term because they're not able, they become people pleasers uh, and they become weak and unable to make tough calls and things like this because they've been too forced from an early age to kind of, often he analysed it back to the idea that sometimes you get parents who are volcanic in their tempers so they dissuade children from ever making any kind of fuss or any kind of problem because the parents are so stressed that they would scream if the child did anything. Or maybe the parent is very depressed and would sort of say, you know, don't add to my stress, I'm, I'm falling apart already. So the children are just going to learn to tiptoe and become very good boys and girls. And so it looks as though everything's fine. They're very, they do well at school, etc. But they become somehow lacking in an ability to kind of speak. And I think when you talk about a benign regime, it sounds like you would have allowed your children to to be honest you know if they had a bad mood or if they were were you know feeling dissatisfied with something you you allowed them just enough room presumably if it went over a certain stage you might say well now that's enough but gave them just enough room well Ali, you, you to show it, their shadow sides you flatter me by suggesting that this might have been planned uh, well you know it's, it's, it's random it's un- I'm just, well it's just lazy it's and... a good lesson in the unconscious yeah we don't need to you know. but it's funny what you were saying about about uh, children who learn to be good too soon and to be people pleasers but i have a theory that that even things qualities that might seem to be problematic um human qualities um might actually be beneficial for example if you're if you're a people pleaser okay so they're, they're probably messed up in their heads at the same time you look at some of the people who've really got on in our world the people who are doing really well the courtier people who are court <laughs> who are good courtiers who are good at sucking up to oligarchs or to uh, the, the people funding their newspaper or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you, you know the kind of people we mean. Actually, that's quite a good skill that those those parents have ruined them with. Uh, yes, I mean, look, there's a certain there's a, there's an effective version of the people pleaser, but I think there's also the sort of person who has never been able to take any initiative, suggest anything new, advance a slightly contrary or intriguing idea. I mean, I think you know, I think the advance of civilization does depend on slightly contrary or tricky opinions being uh, put forward and I'm sure you know we've both experienced organizations for example where those who get on yes they're they know how to be smooth and they know how to uh, you know stroke feathers at, at certain points but they also have some ideas uh, a vision of things I mean if you if you really have nothing if you're if you're so timid inside you can't advance anything you'll be held back as well I you see I've uh, I've got a, an alternative theory um just based really on, on random prejudice and mixed up with observing my, my children growing up. I think that we have very, very little influence over the way our children turn out. I think they're, they're pretty much born with their, with their genes. I reckon that, that your footballing son, he, he was born that way. Well, obviously he was because you didn't, you didn't encourage him by kicking a ball around the park, I imagine. James, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there's this issue of you know, free will versus kind of a more determined view. It's one of the great issues of philosophy. My, my thought is always, 
however much one agrees that, yes, maybe it's all determined by nature, it doesn't feel that way minute by minute. In other words, when I go and have a nap on a Sunday thinking, oh, well, the kids will sort themselves out, it doesn't matter. I'm half unable to sleep because I'm thinking, oh, I'm being a bad father. I should go and take them to a museum, read them something, you know, entertain them in some way, do something with them. Um, and, and I think that, you know, all of us feel quite responsible, even if it turns out that our life is being, you know, is on strings and being pulled by some evil demon off stage. We don't live that way. We live as though we're free and what we do really matters. And I think whether that's true or not, doesn't matter. It feels like that, which is why we have so much anxiety. Let's remember existentialism. Existentialism is this philosophy, right? It starts off in Denmark in the 19th century, and it's all about the weight of choice when you realize that everything you do has such big effects, whether you marry this person or that one, take this job, do that one, write this book, write that one. These things have major impact on your life and we don't know how to make that choice. Um, so maybe it's all determined, maybe it's all in your genes, but you know, say that to somebody who's up at 3 a.m. thinking, oh, what shall I do? You know, which we all do. Uh, it doesn't feel, it feels very consequential. I suppose what I'm saying is that we do it for ourselves rather than for our children. Actually, we're making bugger all difference, but we are, we are doing it because we can't help it. We can't yes. help worrying about it. Yes. And we want to kid ourselves that we have more influence than yes. we ac actually do. Yes. It's ab apparently, it's, I read somewhere, it's, it, uh, so much of this is to do with, with peer pressure, um, the, what their mates are doing, not, not, not what you tell them to do. And, and, and this comes back to what we were saying earlier about how resistant the little bastards are to our wisdom. That's true. We could, we could just, we could make their life, present it to them on a plate. Look, just do this, do that, and you'll be... T I, and I'm often telling my, my daughter, all you need to do, marry a duke, or if you're failing out a marquis, you'll get a stable full of hunters, you'll be sorted, you'll be so much happier, darling. I, I... Will she listen? <laughs> Thank goodness for her, her, she, her wisdom. Um, but look, undoubtedly we're sitting in the cockpit and most of the buttons we're pressing are not really connected up to anything. It's like the lift, it's like the yeah. buttons in the lift, which exactly. door closed. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's part of being human. It's the glory of being human that we keep pressing those buttons. I mean, you know, the moment we stop pressing those buttons, we'll have given up. So let's keep pressing the buttons, hope something nice happens, and wish ourselves the best. I must just tell you the, bad, the one bad thing I've done with my children. I, when they were, when they were growing up, I particularly, um, we used to take them for walks in Dulwich Park and, um, in the winter that the lake would sometimes frost over i remember walking through the park once and seeing this seeing this sign on this wooden walkway bridge thing saying do not do not cross safety hazard so my instant reaction was to take them over the sign across the bridge and then to, because i didn't like this bloody authority telling us what to do and then and then i saw the lake was frozen so i took them for a walk on the lake and i got told off by a passerby and too I thought, right I, and I thought this is a bad and this honor. shaped your politics no, no, I think it's just a reflection <laughs> of my politics, and I'm hoping yes. that maybe the children will, will have inherited, well, they bloody have, unfortunately, this, this contrarian, contrarian... Yeah. Although, to be contrarian to you and yeah. to their family upbringing, they'll become part of the liberal elite. Oh, they, and we're well... Oh, the and door is open to them. You, the, we're... I'm waiting to welcome them with open arms. The gods, the, the gods may be cruel, Alan, but the gods would not be so cruel that they would give me liberal children. That'd be I think they already have. <laughs> uh, Alan, it's been fantastic to talk to you. We could have, we could have totally talked for about five hours, and, totally. and maybe we will on, on the next podcast, which we must do together. Um, you were listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, with my special guest, Alan de Botton, brought to you by Breitbart. Thank you and goodbye.